seated, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Esther chapter 1. And uh, we're starting off a new series. Thank you. Uh, we're starting off a new series um, in Esther to really kick off 2021, because uh, in 2021, we're going to be preaching through the Old Testament. Well, not preaching through the whole Old Testament. That would be relatively impossible, especially given it's me that's doing a majority of the preaching. But um, we're, we'll, uh, we'll be lucky to make it through Esther. But um, we, I decided that Esther would be a really good place to start. We're going to preach through some different parts of the Old Testament in 2021, and Esther would be a really good place to start. And one of the reasons I think that Esther would be a really good place to start is because I think it gives us a uh, beautiful and brilliant illustration of how we should approach the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Uh, so you have, uh, this has been a technologically challenging morning, just so you know. We, we had slides. They're not here. They'll be here next week. We'll figure it out. Um, right, Jeremy? He's kind of the, the go-to guy for this stuff. At any rate, um, Esther is really a beautiful illustration of how we should approach the Old Testament. And here's why. When we say, uh, as believers, we'll say things like, Jesus changes everything, right? Do we, do we really believe that? What, do, what does that mean when we say Jesus changes everything? Does he and what he did and his life, death, burial, resurrection, and future return change how we read and how we understand the Old Testament, for example? Um, the answer is it should. And the reason that Esther is such a great book to illustrate this is because God's name is not mentioned once in the entire book. And this book is not referenced anywhere else in the Bible. It's kind of like the standalone book in which the name of God is conspicuously absent. And yet his work is beautifully shown if you have eyes to see it, if you're looking for it. And so some people might like the book of Esther, and maybe you like the book of Esther because you can identify with a character. Maybe it's Mordecai or Esther. Hopefully it's not Xerxes or um, Haman. Like, the, let's try to have the right aspirations here. But at the same time, um, like I, I like Esther because I think it beautifully illustrates what I call fierce femininity, Right? Like, I've got three girls, so I've been forced to come face to face with this reality of, like, what does a godly biblical woman look like? Um, and, and they've got a great example in their mother, but then there's these aspects that I, that I want to cultivate within them. And, and the best way I've been able to express it is fierce femininity. These are women that have a backbone of steel, that are courageous, that uh, are deeply committed to God and his truth, and yet tender and gentle and have a submissive spirit, right? That's fierce femininity. And so we could look at the book of Esther and be like, well, yeah, that's a great example of fierce femininity. Uh, we could look at the book of Esther and say, well, it's a great example of how we live under a pagan uh, authority. And all those things might be true, but you miss something if you jump straight to that. So Esther is really great because it does have a lot of practical things that we can take from it that will affect and influence how we live our lives as Christians, but we only get those with the full weight and the full force if we see that the book of Esther is not really about Esther. The book of Esther is really about God. The book of Esther uses this main character of Esther as a supporting role. And, and the, the hero, the main character, is not named once in the book. And so I think that this book is a great way for us to start in the Old Testament. If you want some context, uh, this, this book ha happens, between, happens between Esther, uh, or I'm sorry, Ezra 6 and 7, and its story covers about a decade. Nobody knows really who the human author is. Some people argue that it was Mordecai that wrote it. Others would argue that it is Nehemiah. We do know that it was written by the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit and therefore is part of all of Scripture, which is profitable for us. Um, so with that as a background, I want to spend some time together going through this wonderful book. And as a side note, this book is also unique because it's just sort of like a running story. 
There's no commentary. We don't know anybody's internal motivations. It never says what God's perspective is. All it is is it's sort of like a history. It's a running story of this event that happened. And so in order to get the most out of it, I would suggest that maybe you, uh, with your friends or your family or whoever, even by yourself, uh, read through this book a few times uh, as we're going through it because... um, This story demands an understanding of the totality of the narrative in order to appreciate its different different movements. So it would be helpful for you to be familiar with the story as we go through it. So uh, this morning, we're going to look at chapter 1. And what we're going to see is that there, since you don't have slides, if you're a note taker, here are the, the three pieces, right? A great king, a great kingdom, and a shadow king and kingdom. Okay, a great king, a great kingdom and a shadow king and kingdom. So first of all, a great king. The very first character we are introduced to is this king. Verse 1, now in the days of Ahasuerus, um, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces, the first character we meet in this story is this king Ahasuerus. Ahir- uh, now to prevent this from being a habitual thing, since his name is mentioned over 150 times in this book, we're going to call him by what you might know him as, King Xerxes. So if you're a history buff like me, you know that the Persians invaded Greece, and there was this great battle of Thermopylae in which 500 Spartans, along with some auxiliary soldiers, held off millions of Persians for, what is it, three days or something like that, and delayed their movement, gave them devastating, uh, gave a devastating blow to their numbers, and bought the, the Greeks time to organize and to, to organize a defense, right? King Leonidas and the 300 Spartans. Uh, this is that guy. This is that king, King Xerxes. So we're just going to call him that from now on um, to, to save you and me the trouble of trying to understand what the heck I'm saying. Um, and well, the first thing we see is, it, it, let's, let's look at this king first. Uh, this king is a big deal. The book starts by showing the extent of his influence and power. So we see, first of all, that this king had a reign that was vast. Look at verse 1. It says, he reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. Now, in that time, India to Ethiopia represented the extreme boundaries of the known world. 127 provinces. Now, a lot of people think that the United States is a big deal because there's 50 states. This is like, this is more than double that. So this is a massive empire, and those provinces were probably be bigger than uh, some of our states. And so as you look at these opening verses, a picture begins to build of the greatness of this king. His reign was vast. He was the premier ruler in his day. Second of all, we see that his wealth was impressive. Verse 2, in those days when King Xerxes sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him. So we see that his wealth is impressive. He's first pictured sitting on a throne. Now, this is no normal throne, right? This is not what you, would, what you would imagine a throne room is like in England, for example. This is a great hall in which this throne towers 20 feet above the rest of his subjects. So he is constantly looking down on his subjects as a picture of his wealth and power. He has this massive throne, and we see him giving two feasts. The first feast lasts for 180 days. Now, if you're bad at math, like me, you have to use a calculator, that is six months. This is a six-month party that this king holds for the army of Persia, and media, and the nobles and governors of the provinces, and they were all before him. So 127 provinces, all of the leaders and officials from those provinces, all of the soldiers in his armies coming to Susa to have this great six-month feast. This is a status symbol. This king is so wealthy that he can sustain that kind of party for six months. 
That is extravagant. Now, this party is not like maybe a party that you would be familiar with. This is an extravagant party. As we go on, there are going to be details of the decorations and what they drank. They drank out of golden goblets. Now, 127 provinces, all of the um, officials from those provinces, the soldiers, everything else, all drinking from these gold cups. There's, there's beautiful decorations all around. The whole place is decked out. There is wine and food flowing constantly for all of these people for six months. Some of you, like me, who have daughters, are stressing out about, are they, are, like, I'm going to have to feed 50 people maybe because, like, I'm not, I'm going to limit the wedding to 50 because that's all we, we can afford to feed for one night. And this guy is feeding all of these people and, and giving them drink for six months. This is a status symbol. He's saying to everybody, you might be able to do this for a day or a week. I'm doing it for six months. You think you're a big deal? You think you're wealthy? Look at this. And then he follows that six-month feast up with one that lasts for seven days, which seems to be for those who are responsible for making sure that the six-month feast happened. And this one's held in his garden. And we get a picture of the grandeur of this courtyard in the garden displays his wealth and power. Look at verse 6. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linens and purple to uh, uh, linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement. Like it just goes on and on. Mother of pearl. This is, oh, it's a wealthy guy. Number three. We also see his rule is ultimate. Look at verse 3. In the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all of his officials and servants. The army of Persia, Media, and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him. That word before him is a picture of obedience and submission. They came and presented themselves to him when summoned. Now, I want you to think about the Middle East where this guy reigned. From India to Ethiopia, how many different people groups had been conquered? How many different ethnicities? How many different cultures were brought together by this ruler? When he said, come to my party, they all showed up. They all showed themselves before him. They all presented themselves to him. This is a ruler whose rule is ultimate. When he says, come, they show up. And the purpose of all of this in verse 4 was for him to show his riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. So he says, all of you people, show up to my place. I'm going to show you who I am. And they say, yes, sir, we're here. And they present themselves before him as obedient, submissive um, subjects to this ruler. In fact, I found out as I was studying for this, the archaeologists have found inscriptions on architecture in the capital of Persia, And here's one of them. I am Xerxes, the great king, the only king, the king of all countries which speak all kinds of languages, the king of this entire big, far-reaching earth. It's a big deal. This guy is a big deal. His rule was ultimate. In verse 9, the queen also throws a feast because it would have been inappropriate for the women to dine with the men, so she throws a feast for the women. And and in verse 9, look at the bottom of verse 9. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Xerxes. The author is like going out of his way to say like all of this was his, his reign, his rule, his house. He is a big deal. He owned everything. It wasn't her palace. It was his. And then he gives a law in verse 8 to govern the feast and the drinking during the feast. Verse 8, he says, and the drinking was according to his to this edict. There is no compulsion, for the king has given orders to all the staff of his palace to do each man to do as each man desired. So you come to this party, you show yourself before this king whose rule is ultimate, and his rule is so ultimate, he is such a bureaucrat that he's gonna govern how you drink. you might be getting some one-to-one comparisons with some contemporary issues we face. This guy shows up and he says, my rule is there is no rule when it comes to drinking. He had to say it. He had to be involved. That's how much his rule was ultimate. One final thing about this king 
In verses 10 and 11, we're going to breeze over this because we'll come back to this, but his bride was beautiful. In verse 10 and 11, uh, look at verse 11. Uh, he instructs these, these um, eunuchs to bring the queen, bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show all the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. So this guy's wealthy. This guy's, this, this guy's rule is vast. His word is ultimate, and he has a gorgeous wife. His, the, the beauty of his bride is unmatched. So here's the point. We get a picture from the beginning verses of Esther, of this king who is master over a great kingdom, filled with self-importance, projecting majesty, power, and wealth, and who views himself as the king over all. For this king, bigger was better, and it was all aimed at highlighting him. So you get the picture of this king. What about his kingdom? Second point, a great kingdom. You see, this king was all about showing off his power and majesty. But in this chapter, we also get a glimpse of his kingdom. The kingdom, side note, you might want to take note of this as we go through this book of Esther in particular, but this is a general truth. The kingdom will always reflect the king. And this is no different when it comes to King Xerxes. So we see these qualities of him that are put on display, but the kingdom will display what they actually look like. So let's look at some pictures we see in this kingdom. First of all, addictions are fed and sin is encouraged in this kingdom. The king feeds addictions and encourages sin. And, and the author uses this as a picture of what the Bible elsewhere calls the world, right? Right? This kingdom is representative of the world, the kingdom of this world. The world in the Bible is not just a physical world God created. It's a spiritual temperature of his creatures that are separated from him under the control of sin and servants of their father, the devil. Xerxes and his kingdom are marked by the quintessential worldly attitude of feeding addictions and encouraging sin. Look at verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded, here we go, Mehumen, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass. Now, if you're looking for biblical names for your children, Carly, I would not recommend these. But these are the king's eunuchs that serve him. Seven eunuchs who served in the presence of, of King Xerxes to bring Queen Vashti before the king in her royal crown. Now, uh, notice at the beginning of the verse, it says, when his heart was merry with wine. That's another way of saying he had too much to drink. Now, over six months of overindulgence, remember the rule, no compulsion. Let each man do as he desires. This is pure, this, is, this, this kingdom is represented as a, as a culture of pure, unfettered hedonism. Whatever you want to do, you do. Now, the text doesn't exactly specify this, but we can imagine in the pagan Persian culture that much more than merely drinking was happening. A bunch of men sitting around, getting drunk, start talking. They probably had concubines and prostitutes that came to their feast while the women had their feast. Fleshly desires are not bridled and not killed, but they are fed and encouraged. Self-control and mastery are not valued. It is a culture of pure hedonism. That is what this kingdom is about. The king had a wife, but he also had... Um, a harem with a host of concubines and other wives. So this kingdom encouraged sin and promoted licentious behavior. This kingdom also, number two, in this kingdom, manhood was perverted and family was devalued. Look at verses 10 and 11. So we read the names. I won't read them again. But these were seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king. And they're told to go and bring King, Queen Vashti and, and to present her before everyone. And the queen refuses. 
And the king becomes enraged. And then what does he do? He banishes her. So manhood is perverted and family is devalued. So first we see that manhood is perverted. We see it perverted in two pictures in this chapter. First we see eunuchs who have been emasculated. And then we see misogynistic men who are abusive. We see men who have literally been robbed of their manhood, and we see men who don't understand how to wield manhood for good. In this kingdom of the world, many have become emasculated wimps or abusive pigs. We see that today, don't we? We see men who are either portrayed as idiots, incompetent. We see boys that can shave. They're ridiculed, feminized. And on the other hand, we see men wielding power to abuse those that they should be protecting. So manhood is perverted, but we also see in this kingdom that there is a disregard for family. The normative way that God has designed for humans to function in the most basic unit is that of a family with a man and a woman joined together in marriage for a lifetime that have children and raise those children. That is the basic unit that God created. It predates government. It predates the church. It was from the beginning. That's how God designed for everything to happen. And in this kingdom, the basic institution of marriage is defiled. There is no regard for the covenant of marriage. The king just puts his wife away as if she were nothing, as if she were uh, an animal that had outlived its usefulness. There is a harem full of women to suit the king's every whim and desire. He's not faithful to his wife. There's no such thing as monogamy in this culture. This is a perversion of God's design. She upsets him, so he put her away, banished her. She was viewed as an object, not as an equal. But we also see eunuchs who are castrated to prevent them from having a family. There's a disregard for the blessing of children in some cases and a desire to withhold that blessing for personal gain. So as I was studying this, I found out that some people would willingly, voluntarily mutilate their boys as children, prevent them from having the ability to have children in the hopes that they would someday be able to serve in a court as a eunuch because it would increase the family's status from where they were before. So family is devalued, masculinity is perverted. We also see in this kingdom that women are objectified. This king is all about elevating himself. He tells the eunuchs to go parade his wife before a garden full of drunken men. He wants to put her on display to show off her beauty for his gain. The word in verse 11, he says, bring Queen Vashti before the king with a royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty is the same word as in verse 4. In verse 4, while he showed the riches of his royal glory and splendor and pomp, So he's putting his wife on display for his own gain so that other men can ogle at her and become jealous of him for having such a beautiful wife. This is a sick pervert. I don't even really need to expand on this, but notice a couple things. The king's attitude toward his wife. First of all, she was property. Womanhood, women were objectified. She was just property. The king also wanted others to admire her beauty and desire her. He wanted them to be jealous of him. What kind of sick person gets his kicks off of other men desiring his wife? This king wanted to display the beauty of his bride in a way that degraded her. Now, there's some debate whether she, the early um, rabbis said that in this passage, it says that she's to show up with her royal crown. They said it was only her royal crown, so they wanted her, they, they thought that this meant that they were, the king was parading her naked in front of all these drunken men with just her crown. There's, um, uh, there's been some contesting views of that, and, and at the very least, at the very least, in Persian culture in this time, He wanted her to parade herself without a veil, with her face exposed. And in that culture, that was below the standard of modesty and the standard of a queen. So he's degrading womanhood. He's objectifying his wife. 
We also see that there's this large group of women who are kept together to be available to the king whenever he wants. They're objects for, of pleasure and nothing more. And when Vashti refuses, refuses to appear, the king dispo, uh, deposes her. So I want you to notice what the author is doing because in the first 9, 10, 11 verses, the author is painting this picture of this grand majestic, powerful, impressive king. And all of that changes in verse 12. His wife thwarts his plan, and he starts whining to his officials and asking, what do I do about my, my wife who won't show up when I tell her to show up? She just defied me. I'm a great king. She can't do that. Now, you're laughing, right? That's the right response. The author wants you to laugh because this is satire. This is snark. This is building up this picture of this great king who's brought to tears because of a domestic dispute and that sets into motion this series of events that leads to a Jewish woman becoming queen and saving her people. This is no great sovereign king. He is a king that is in the shadow of a great sovereign king. It's, it's funny when you read it. It's like, here's this great guy, and, and what, what happens? Is, so he plans to replace her as if nothing, she was nothing more than an animal that had outlived its usefulness. So women are objectified. The last thing about this kingdom is power is the primary concern. Look at verses 13 to the end. In verse 13, when the king said to his wise man who uh, knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all those who were versed in the law and uh, judgment, the men next to him being, I'm not going to pronounce those names, uh, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. So here's the picture. This, this king has this great throne that's sitting 20 feet above everybody, and he's got these little these little um, sycophant advisors that are in these little mini thrones that are next to him. Right? And their whole job is to advise him. When you've got a king this great, you, you start advising him in ways that not only build up his status, but also promote your interests. So look at, what, look at what happens. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti? Because she has not performed the command the king, uh, her, uh, king Xerxes uh, delivered by the eunuchs. Then Mamukin, it's another great name for your kids, Mamukin, um, said in the presence of the king and the official, not only has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of the king of, uh, of King Xerxes. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will all say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. What's their primary concern over a small domestic dispute? Power. King is all about power. He regulates the drinking, so it is to be done in a way that he says. An insecurity like this produces petty bureaucrats that try to control every aspect of life. So it is always the state that's giving permission or prohibiting from doing something. It's about power. That's the same thing with these people were about. They were about power. Their main concern at this point is a women's liberation movement that runs and, and expands all the way throughout the Persian Empire such that families are turned upside down and men are not able to control their homes anymore, especially the men of the, the officials or the, the homes of the officials. Again, satire. Here's this great king who reigns and rules over 127 provinces, whose wealth is massive. And what are they concerned about in this kingdom? The queen refused to came, come when you called her, and that's going to cause women throughout the, the kingdom to rise up in rebellion against their husbands, and there's going to be chaos, and we're going to lose power. So, we see four characteristics of this kingdom. 
Addictions are fed and sin is encouraged. Manhood is perverted and family is devalued. Women are objectified as objects of pleasure and power is the primary concern. Now ask yourself, are these characteristics that we see in this first chapter of Esther characteristics of the kingdom of this world? I mean, do we see this today? The world doesn't try to make you do things you naturally don't want to do. It doesn't try to prevent you from sin. It tries to make sin easier, more enticing. That's what the world does. And so in our time, this is what the kingdom of the worlds are about. In our own culture, we're being told that to be a part of the kingdom means you can do whatever you want. Nothing's off limits. Want to change your gender? Fine. You want to kill your baby? No problem. You want to do hard drugs? You just go to the kingdom of Oregon, and you can do that now. This is is what, like, we're not so far removed from the Persian Empire and King Xerxes' reign and rule because it's quintessential of the whole world. That's how the world functions. What about family and marriage and fidelity? We don't need to go into how marriage is dishonored in our culture. Easy divorce, you upset me, we're done. Lack of commitment, lack of fidelity. The, uh, the, the um, inconsistency of sexual relations before marriage with that being something reserved for husband and wife. But what about our attitude toward children? How many people see children as a barrier to advancement and status? We also see that in our current culture, women are objectified and and are objects of pornographic lust. The the idea of men honoring women and valuing them as having a particular glory bestowed upon them by God is mocked and scoffed and laughed at in our culture. It shows up not only in men who sexually objectify women, but also in women abandoning their particular role in the name of empowerment. If a man opens a door for a woman to honor her, some would say that he is demeaning her because men should show no preferential treatment to women whatsoever. What about power? See that? Look at all the power grabs we see around us. The state is increasingly controlling its subjects and exercising power over its people. Petty decrees, edicts, mandates on the whim of people in power. It even happens in churches where people disregard Christian liberty and try to regulate every aspect of life that the Bible doesn't address. So we are living in a world that reflects this kingdom. The point is that we see these attitudes of this great worldly kingdom all around us. So that brings us to the third point. A shadow king and a shadow kingdom. Now the question is, where's God in all this, right? That's the question that that people were probably asking at this point as they're reading this story. That's the question that many of us here are asking as we look at our culture around us. Where's God? Like, look at all of this evil that's happening, and it seems to be happening at breakneck speed with a snowball that's going down a hill, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and faster and faster and faster. Where is God in all of this? And in this book, God is not mentioned. So remember I said kingdom reflects the king. The kingdom reflects the king. So all of these characteristics we saw about King Xerxes fleshed themselves out in his kingdom. His rule was vast, and yet he objectifies women and perverts manhood. His bride was beautiful but not valued and was viewed as expendable. His word was law, but only serves his own interests and power rather than the good of others and their joy. His wealth was vast and serves to promote and encourage sin. And there's an irony in this because this part of the book leaves us longing for something more than what this world has to offer. Is this the best that it gets? And God offers a real and better alternative. So we've set the historical context. We've made our observations. Now the question comes, where is God? How is this pointing us to God? And I think there's two main ways. We saw a great king, and it's pointing us to God because Jesus is a better king. 
So we, if you were with us over Christmas, you remember us looking at Jesus as the true king. And perhaps, perhaps as we looked at those, those characteristics of Xerxes, some bells went off and you saw his self-importance and illusion of power and you thought, man, this guy thinks he's a god. Well, he really did think of himself as a god. And, and here's the interesting thing. This side note, um, people that view themselves as having ultimate authority but not under authority become petty, insecure, bureaucratic control freaks. Right? People in authority who view themselves as having authority derived from them as them as the ultimate authority become insecure, petty, bureaucratic tyrants. Whereas those who sit joyfully under authority find a sense of security, a sense of limitation, and a sense of peace, knowing that, th that it ultimately is not about them. And Jesus willingly submits himself to the authority of the Father and establishes this kingdom in which he reigns and rules as the ultimate authority. And so that means that King Xerxes is not the ultimate authority, no matter how much he thinks he is. And you and I fall into that same problem. We think that we are the ultimate authority in our lives, and what we fail to do is place ourselves under the authority of King Jesus, where there is security and blessing and peace and joy. Because if you're the ultimate authority in your life, you are going to reign and rule in your heart like Xerxes did from his throne. Our only hope is that there's a better king that we're under. Our only hope in this story is that Xerxes is under this king even though he doesn't realize it. And so we see King Jesus, even though he's not mentioned, this shadowy king is pointing to the need for a greater king. Everything that Xerxes has comes from God. That's the irony. All of his power, all of his wealth, all of it was given to him by God. None of it would have happened if God had not decreed it and allowed it. God raises up kings and he tears down kings. King Jesus is not some insecure monarch who must be validated by parading his wealth, compelling adoration, and offering um, ruin to his subjects. He's not an inept ruler that's a slave to his passions. He doesn't depend on sycophants for advice, but works everything according to the counsel of his will, which is always good. All of the failures of Xerxes, in other words, point to the failures of humanity that are remedied by bringing ourselves under the rightful authority and claim of King Jesus. Where when we live under his authority... His rule really is ultimate, but it's for our good and joy. His wealth is vast, and he shares it with us. His word is law, and, and it brings good for us. His, it, when I said his, his rule is vast, it, he, he controls every aspect of this universe. He reigns over it. So all of the failures of Xerxes point to the failures of humanity. They're your failures. They're my failures. We want to sit on our throne. And we think if we could just be king, we would have done better than this. We need a different king. We need a better king. This narrative leads us longing for a better king, and a better king is what God provides us in Christ, a perfect king, a righteous king, a powerful king, the true king of kings and lord of lords, not like Xerxes, who imagines himself that way, but really isn't. So I've got homework for you. This is unusual. I think this would be beneficial for you. This is your homework. How is King Jesus the same as King Xerxes? And how is King Jesus different than King Xerxes? So my suggestion would be that you have a conversation with your family or friends this week your spouse, whatever, try to answer that question. How is King Xerxes and King Jesus? How are they the same and how are they different? But not only is Jesus a better king, but Jesus offers a better kingdom. The book of Esther continuously invites us to compare and contrast 
the kingdom of God with the empire of Xerxes. And there are superficial similarities that can hide the deeper differences. God is a great king who cannot be challenged. His sovereignty governs all things. He must be obeyed, yet his commands are beneficial. God doesn't use people for his own purposes as if they were disposable commodities. Instead, he graciously invites us into relationship with him. His kingdom grows and expands not through outward power and conquest, but through the hidden, sometimes invisible power of the king at work in us. At the Messianic banquet, we see that the king summons his bride, the church, but it's not to expose her shame, but to lavish her with grace, mercy, and love. He doesn't force people to come unwillingly to his feast, but gently woos and draws them to himself. So just think about the bride of Christ for for a minute. We said said that Queen Vashti was beautiful. That was one of the characteristics of this king. And that he, that another characteristic of the kingdom that was an extension of that characteristic of the king is that women were objectified. God doesn't view his bride as a beautiful object existing solely to feed his pride and pleasure. The beauty of the church is not put on display at her expense. Instead, This is a key difference. He takes that which is naturally ugly and unattractive because of sin, gives himself for her, makes her beautiful by sacrificing his own life and displays her beauty in a way that honors her. All of our righteousness and beauty comes from him as a gracious gift and we are never displayed at our own expense. So here's your, um, does, it, does it seem like God is silent, right? Does it seem like he's silent now? Surely did to the Jews during this time, yet he wasn't. He was working toward the kingdom being established through the arrival of the king. And this kingdom is distinctly different from worldly kingdoms, just as their king, as her king is distinct from earthly kings. So here's the second piece of homework. How is the kingdom of God the same as the kingdom of Xerxes? And how is it different? How is the kingdom of God the same as the kingdom of Xerxes? And how is it different? So you see, even in the first chapter, the opening chapter of Esther, it's pointing us back to God. It's pointing us to God who is at work in the background. And we'll see that more and more as this progresses. The story is not about Esther. The story is about God. So let me just close with three things that might be helpful for us to apply in our own lives that we can take from this chapter. First one is this. Don't take the power, wealth, and glory of this world too seriously. Don't take the power, wealth, and glory of this world too seriously. As I mentioned before, this is satire. The author is painting a picture of a king that is so over the top that when we read what Vashti does and how he responds, the only response that we should have is to laugh and mock it. That's a good response to have. Who says the Bible doesn't value sarcasm and snark? The world tends to take itself way too seriously, as if it's ultimate. Those in power think of themselves as if they're sovereign in reality. Those who think of themselves with the most seriousness and put themselves and their power on display the most show themselves to be insecure buffoons most of the time. And we have a tendency to take the world too seriously also in our interactions with it. And we get shocked when those in authority act stupidly. We can also take ourselves too seriously. We can think we are way more important than we really are, or that we are above being idiots. If I was a boss, I'd do better. This place won't function without me. God can't do this without me. He needs me in this point right now. Well, he doesn't need you. He might use you. But it's not as if he's wringing his hands over you. Don't take yourself too seriously. 
There are times when the appropriate response is to join God in laughing. Maybe that'll change. Maybe that'll change the way you read or watch the news. Some of it's just hilarious because it shows the kingdom of this world and all of its buffoonery and stupidity. Second thing that we should take away, by the way, Psalm, if you want to write down a text to look at Psalm 37, 12 to 13, God laughs at the nations. Psalm 59, 8, he laughs. We should join him sometimes. Second thing that we can apply to ourselves, sometimes we have to wait to see what God is doing. Just because we don't see what God is doing doesn't mean that he's inactive, indifferent, or impotent in the situation. He's still in control. He's still active behind the scenes. His providence and sovereignty are still intact. He is still the God who raises up leaders and tears them down in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. He still steers the heart of the king like a stream in Proverbs 21, 1. As we saw before, he laughs at the nations. Nations and governments rage against him, but he overcomes them and he sets his king over them in Psalm 2. God is a God who is for his people. And some of you need to hear that. That means when it looks as if God is inactive or absent, perhaps we are looking in the wrong place and looking for the wrong thing. Faith and trust produce an attitude of waiting on God. Psalm 27 is a prayer to God for help, and the conclusion is David is confident he will see the Lord. It's a future hope beyond this world. God is active, and therefore he will wait. It's patient, confident trust in the Lord, even and perhaps especially when you don't see or understand what he is doing. So don't allow yourself to land in a place where you conclude and believe that he's absent, inactive, or has abandoned you. If you're a Christian, that is objectively not true. It is impossible because of Christ. He will not leave us or forsake us. He has overcome the world. He is for us. He withholds no good thing from us. He is our ever-present help in times of trouble. He comforts us. He leads us. He is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Esther chapter 1 verse 10 is, a, is in story form what Romans 8.28 is in a sentence. The book of Esther is in story form what Romans 8.28 is in a sentence. But know this, nothing and no one can thwart the purposes and plans of God, and he is not inactive, especially when you don't see him. Final thing, we must guard against assimilation and despair. We're tempted toward this today. We look around us and we're, we're tempted to either buy into the world or to fret as if this is it. And there's nothing beyond what we see. So let me offer two texts in closing that will help guard us against these temptations and help us to live faithfully. The first one is in John chapter 17. So go over to John chapter 17. This is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. In John 17, in verse 15, Jesus prays, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And then look at verse 18. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So the prayer here is you're being sent and I'm praying that God will keep you. Don't assimilate, but don't with retreat. Right? That's the picture. Be like Jesus. Go and impact the culture rather than buying into the culture. But also don't run away from the culture. That's what Jesus did. He went in and he confronted the culture with the truth of God's gospel and that transformed things. So he's praying that we would be kept. So you've heard that little phrase, in the world, not of the world, that's not in the Bible anywhere. I would propose that it's better to say, sent into the world and kept. That's how we need to view ourselves. That keeps us from assimilating. But then there's also... Don't despair. 
In John chapter 16, verse 33, I've said these things to you that you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Don't despair. Jesus is greater. He has won. Take heart. Don't despair. Don't be downcast. Jesus has won the victory. He has overcome the world. His kingdom has come, and there will be no end to his kingdom, and nothing in this world can overthrow that kingdom. Xerxes' kingdom lies in the dust, and we excavate it for archaeological artifacts. Jesus' kingdom has been established and will never end. So trust in that king. Let's pray.